Hello, my name is John Hedengren, and I'm going to give an overview of learning data-driven engineering with interactive modules. I want to start with an experience that I had a couple years ago. We went out to an offshore oil platform, deep water Gulf of Mexico, to install and instrument these fiber optic sensors on the web frames of this hole, of this platform. And this was about 100 feet below the sea level in these large caverns uh, where we attempted to install these, these fiber optic sensors on this plate in, in this, uh, on one of these web frames. And one of the plans that we had was to use the data and feed it through a finite element analysis model to be able to tell the tendon tensions on the platforms. This is a tendon tension leg platform in the Gulf of Mexico. These tendons attach to the seafloor, and it's very important to be able to know the tension on these. So we used this data with this finite element analysis model, and it didn't match the load cells that were there. And so we had a decision at that point. We could abandon the project. This was kind of a trial project to see if it would work, or we could try some other methods. So out there on the platform, we, instead of using the finite element analysis, we performed a regression with the data, compared it to the load cell values and fit, and then set up the data pipelines to turn that into tendon tensions, and then be able to display it on an operator screen. We had to move the numbers with a SQL database and Modbus connections and all the software and systems in order to be able to take all of those raw fiber optic sensors in a fiber optic interrogator running at a thousand hertz and be able to condense that down into information that could display on an operator screen. And one of the things that we did with this is take these signals and use Python to be able to do all of the pipelines and all of the other software architecting. So Python was used for everything, including some of the data analysis, cleansing, uh, be able to perform the regression on a regular interval once a day, be able to re-regress some of the parameters, and then be able to feed those best parameters into the regression model and continuously give a prediction to the operators. So I want to give an overview of what we're going to be discussing today. And this is, a lot of this is motivated by my own practical experience working in chemical plants, refineries, on offshore platforms, and with other projects. I want to show you some of the data-driven engineering tutorials and also an American Institute of Chemical Engineers Academy courses. This is the division of AICHE that uh, is, is concerned with education, especially continuing education. And then give a brief research overview of some of the other activities that I'm involved in and then some conclusions as well. So in this one, I'm going to be focusing in particular on this data-driven engineering. And we're going to talk as well about some of the other courses that are there as well. There are five other courses, starting with Engineering Program, an introduction to programming in MATLAB or Python, also with Excel, to be able to help somebody who has almost zero experience with programming. And then also the Process Control course. That's the one I'd recommend next, or Optimization, and then Machine Learning and Dynamic Optimization. So this new course is apmonitor.com slash DDE for data-driven engineering. And I'll give an overview of some of the modules that are there. And we'll also spend a little bit of time to explore a couple of those modules together. So let's just talk about some of the current trends in programming. There's projected to be a 22% increase in programming jobs over the next decade. And here you can see a graphic that shows some of the most popular programming languages over time. Now, the thing to take away from this is that the popularity of different programming languages changes. There might be a better programming language that receives more developer mindshare. Also, certain industries like web programming, web development, those are going to use certain tools. Now, the interesting thing is that Python has emerged on top here, 
That's also a scientific programming language. So the focus of this course and these courses is going to be really tailored toward engineers who want to be able to do engineering analysis, design, optimization. And fortunately, this Python ecosystem has evolved that includes so many other things even beyond just the engineering design and analysis. So it's like a Swiss army knife of programming languages that can even interact with others and be able to form them like a glue that holds everything together. That's part of the reason why I was able to do that substantial project with Python because it's full featured and is helps with the data pipelining and other aspects, Modbus connection and, and so on. Okay, so let's just start with some of the basics. For those that are just beginning with Python, I'd recommend these seven modules. First, how to install Python. That's a critical step, and some people end there. They can't get past the how to install Python's phase. Next, just basics, tuples, lists, sets, dictionaries, NumPy, and pandas. And for each of these, there's a 30-minute to one-hour module for each of them. So Python basics, Python tuples, lists, sets, dictionaries, NumPy, and then pandas. We're focusing just on a subset of Python because Python is quite a large, um, has many packages and other features that are important, but we really want to focus on the things that are going to be important for engineers. So this is the Python introduction. Let's just focus on one in particular. So I'm going to visit the course website. So this is the data-driven engineering course website. And if I scroll down a little bit, you'll see this Python overview. And here it gives it just an introduction about why Python and some of the modules that we're going to be going through. Also, I'd recommend this very first one on how to install Python and then also how to install packages as well and be able to manage packages, virtual environments, and other things that are really important with dealing with Python development. So then we go to Python basics. Okay, and as we go down, I'm going to go down to NumPy. Just focus on that one. This is numerical Python. And as you can see, there's a video associated with each of these. And then right underneath it, there is the GitHub link if you want the Jupyter Notebook to run through this. And you can download this directly and run it locally. Or there's also a Google Colab link. So Google Colab lets you run it directly from a web browser or your cell phone or some other environment where you don't have necessarily have to have Python installed. And then when you run it, I'll just go run anyway. Say it's not authored by Google. And then you can run through these exercises. Okay, so each one has these sub-modules on how to install and import NumPy or other packages, for example. And that takes you through some of the basics on working with NumPy arrays with a description of each of those. And then at the very bottom, it's going to have some activities or exercises. So I'll scroll down to the very bottom here. Okay, with, um, you know, exercise, it says 6A, uh, 6B. And one of the things I'm going to show you is if you get stuck, there's different ways to find help. A very good way to do this is um, Stack Overflow. So if you go to Stack Overflow and search for how to insert a zero diagonal in NumPy, okay, you might find something helpful. You can also go to the documentation as well. Another way to do this is uh, through the large language models. And these are evolving very rapidly right now, but they're also very useful. So I'm going to go to AI.com, and then I'm just going to type in this prompt, create Y as a 5x5 five five NumPy array of ones, modify the array to place zeros along the diagonal. So I'll go ahead and copy that prompt and then paste it in here and see if it can give me some help on this problem. 
Okay, so there are many ways to do this, and here is one way you create an array of five by five ones, and then use the np.fill diagonal with zeros. And it's gonna output that following array. So this is one correct way to do that. The other thing is if you have a bug in your code, okay, so what is the error with this Python code? All right. And I'll go ahead and put in some Python. Oops, I made a mistake on that. I did it too fast. Okay, so go ahead and uh, sure, here is the Python code. I need to hit Shift Enter. Okay, and then let me go ahead and put an error in here. Okay, I'll leave out the closing parenthesis. All right, the error in the code is, is missing a closing parenthesis in the print statement. Here is the corrected code. So in learning Python, this is going to be another tool. If you can use it effectively, it can give you immediate feedback as you paste in code or ask it for a little bit of help on some of these modules. I recommend that as well. Okay, so let's come back here to uh, this. This is the module. This just shows the same thing with this uh, five by five NumPy array of ones. Okay, and I recorded that one before, but it's the same thing. Let's go on to data importing. Okay, text, audio, video, database, sensors, cloud, and web scraping. So after we have some of the basics of Python, one of the things that's very important is how do you retrieve data into the Python environment, be able to work with it, and then potentially export it as well? So first thing that we want to do is text data. It's very common, comma-separated value files, ASCII text, text document somewhere that we want to be able to import into Python. Then we'll talk about audio data as well, video data, databases, how to interact with them, primarily through SQLite, okay, SQLite. And then we also have MicroPython to be able to run on embedded devices, cloud processing with Azure, Google Cloud, or AWS, and then also web scraping as well. So a range of ways to be able to interact with data, both in the cloud, locally, on embedded devices, and with a variety of file formats. So let's just take a look at our text data analysis. So I'm gonna go back to the course where you can scan that as well for the link. Okay, and I'm gonna come here to the text analysis. Just give you an idea about what we're doing with this module. And as I scroll down, I'll see this Google Colab link again. I'll go ahead and select it. Now in this module, we are actually collecting data from vehicles and then analyzing it. And it gives some instructions if you want to be able to collect your own data from your own vehicle through an OBD2 connection in your car. There's a little $7 module that you can buy that will be able to connect to your vehicle and you can collect your own vehicle's data. Or you can use the ones that are here as well. Okay, I'll just go ahead and run all. So it shows what we can do with importing text data and analyzing it. And the most important part here is going to be just reading this data file. Okay, and I'm going to do that with a pandas read CSV, and I'm going to read it from a zip file in this case. I'll skip a couple rows, and then I'll describe the data. All right, so it's first of all just importing some libraries. It uh, described, gave a summary, statistical summary of the data. As I look at just the first rows of that, okay, I'll do some data cleansing as well. We'll go through some process of removing some of the bad data. Do some data reduction, like take every tenth row, set the time index, and also add a column, maybe a derived calculated value. Okay, visualize the data. Uh, view some correlations in the data 
and maybe there are some GPS coordinates in the data as well. So here's an example of how to create an interactive plot from that data as well. So you can see a vehicle trip here that was recorded, and you can see the speed, the fuel rate, the latitude, longitude as well. Okay, and this, and um, you can see the trip. So you can do this for your own vehicle as well, and and uh, track your location. All right, and then there's an activity here. So this one. This next one is um, just another data file, different vehicle, different location, and you're asked to compare the two. Now in this case, there's a solution video. Actually, I'll go back to that web page. <clears throat> All right. And if you come up here to the top, there's a solution video that'll walk you through um, the solution. And in fact, down here at the bottom, there's also another video um, or another solution file. You can just click the show solution here. All right, so lots of solutions, lots of helps to be able to help you through that. You can also use something like ChatGPT or Stack Overflow to be able to help find answers to these questions. All right, let me come back to the presentation. All right, so after we've installed Python, know the basics of Python, and also have been able to read data in, there's also an element of data engineering about moving data from computer to computer and doing that with a variety of these modules. And these are common in industrial practice with PLCs, programmable logic controllers, distributed control systems, DCS systems, and others. And so Modbus, MQTT, which is very popular with Internet of Things, uh, OPC UA, uh, very common in distributed control systems. Uh, it's a newer version of this communication protocol, even beyond OPC DA, that's universal architecture. And then we also have kind of a lower level web programming called WebSocket, but there. This also introduces to some REST APIs. There's some other protocols as well that are more common with web developers and app developers. And we don't cover those, but we give an overview of them just to make you aware of them. So Modbus, MQTT, setting up a broker and clients, OPC UA, and then WebSockets. So let me give an overview of some other courses that are available here. I'll talk about, you know, we've talked about data-driven engineering, but I'd like to also introduce some of these others as well, like engineering programming, machine learning optimization, process control, and dynamic optimization. So programming for engineers, again, that's an introduction to programming for somebody who's just beginning, maybe has an engineering background, but wants to be able to use tools like Excel, and Python to be able to solve problems. And there's also equivalent exercises in MATLAB as well. So for each exercise, you have Excel, Python, and MATLAB solving the same problems. Next is data engineering. Data engineering is really the process of taking raw data from sensors and getting it into a form that's curated so that you can do machine learning and data visualization and other activities. So it's really this front end of the process and be able to create valuable data and be able to extract value. But it kind of stops at the machine learning phase. So machine learning is going to be the next one. So machine learning for engineers is really focused on case studies that are relevant to engineering for classification and regression. Now, as you look at this self-driving car, you know that a lot of engineers worked on this to be able to enable this driver or this passenger, really, not touching the steering wheel, gas pedal, or brake, uh, to be able to arrive at a destination without guiding the car. Now, you can see on the right some of the classification that's taking place with the computer vision from the different cameras. 
then the driver leaves the vehicle and requests that the car go find a parking spot. The car is able to go into an autonomous mode, find a parking spot, and be able to parallel park. So as you think about machine learning applications, you think about the many that you interact with on a daily basis, such as email, spam, and malware filtering, online fraud detection with your credit card. You might have speech recognition that you use on your phone, image recognition, and many others. And these examples are going to be increasing as well. I mentioned some of the large language models and how those are going to start um, appearing in some more products that we use on a daily basis. So as we talk about machine learning, there's a roadmap where we start with a business objective. We get data, and if we don't have enough data, we might design and develop a physics-based digital twin to simulate more data. And then we combine these data sets, consolidate the data, visualize with correlations, distributions, and pair plots, also perform statistics on the data, and then perform a data assessment. Do we have the right data to be able to solve this problem? If not, we do more feature engineering to increase the data diversity and maybe even combinations of the data sets to get new features and be able to meet this business objective. Then we go on to data cleansing and outlier detection with and filtering, and then scale the data with either a standard scaler or a min-max scaler. Then we split the data into three sets for train, validation, and testing. And this is for the parameter updates, the hyperparameter optimization, and then performance evaluation. If there are labels, then we can do supervised learning. If there are no labels, then unsupervised learning, like clustering. If there's partial labeling, then we can do semi-supervised learning for classification or regression. So there are many data-driven modeling languages like Scikit-Learn, TensorFlow, and PyTorch, and others, Keras that's a wrapper for TensorFlow. So you have these tools that have been in increasing in popularity as data-driven methods have really been adopted more broadly. More people are using these. They're easier to use. Uh, they are creating interfaces, even for auto machine learning or auto ML, to enable the, and facilitate machine learning applications. Really, what we need to be doing is architecting these solutions. So, being aware of the methods, all of the classification and regression methods, so that when we're given a problem, we know okay, these techniques are going to work well and these techniques won't. I need to be able to adjust the hyperparameters of this one so that it's going to work well. All right, so there are different flow charts that we're going to go through to be able to decide what's appropriate regression, classification, clustering, dimensionality reduction. So many different things that we can look at with machine learning. Next, I want to talk a little bit about engineering optimization. So this is a course where we really delve into the mathematics and of optimization, but also focus on solving optimization problems as engineers. So let's just take one example here, which is a tubular column, designing the thickness and also the diameter of the tubular column to be able to meet a design specification. And I have a module prepared for this, but I also just wanted to see what ChatGPT would do. Okay, if I wanted to optimize a tubular column, design with Python Gecko. So to optimize, um, we can use Gecko optimization capabilities. Here's example code that demonstrates this optimization problem. And I didn't tell it the diameter or the thickness, but it looks like it's learned from my course material or a similar problem to that. And it set up and solved something similar. And then gave a description of the variables. Okay, so it did a fairly good job. This would solve with just a couple minor modifications. Uh, the Gecko package doesn't have a pi uh, variable, so it had just switched that over to the numpy.py. But other than that, it looks correct. 
All right, but let's say I also want to create a contour plot of the optimal solution. So not just create the optimal solution, but be able to visualize it. So this is going to give some suggestions on how to create a contour plot as well. It's going to solve and set up and solve the optimization problem first, just like we did it before. But then it's going to now set up the contour plot as well using a mesh grid to be able to evaluate it over all of these different scenarios and be able to create this contour plot. And again, it does an okay job with this. Uh, there's just a couple minor errors and I'll show the code that it comes up with. Okay. So as I fixed a couple of these uh, minor problems, okay, about four or five lines of code, it came up with this contour plot right here with the optimal column weight versus diameter and wall thickness. But I also wanted it to include the constraints on that contour plot to be able to show not just the objective function, but also the constraints of the contour plot. Okay, so it's going to do it again, but add the constraints of the contour plot. And I'll just show um, you know, my solution for it. It didn't get it quite all the way correct. Um, plus, I wanted to add a couple other things on there as well. So I'll just show you uh, my solution as well after this one finishes. But again, it gets fairly close, uh, you know, in, in terms of solving an optimization problem, creating contour plots, being able to explain the solution. Okay, so there's its contour plot. And it explains a little bit about what it's doing in terms of creating it. All right, so here's the column design. There's the diameter and the thickness. And then this is my solution, not the one that it created, but I want to show the optimum. So I could have continued to ask it for additional things. It would have been able to modify the code and then get it fairly close. But the star is where the optimum occurs. And then you have the buckling constraint and then the stress constraint there as well. All right, so let's go on to Python and MATLAB for process dynamics and control. In this case, there are live scripts, MATLAB live scripts, interactive, but also Jupyter Notebooks and interactive modules in process dynamics and control, and combining the theory simulation and then the temperature control lab. And this one has a similar flowchart to the machine learning course. But in this case, it shows some of the modeling up top being able to create these empirical first order plus dead time, time series state space, or physics-based models, and using graphical fits, regression, or just the physics-based modeling to create these. Next, on the bottom part, if you have a measure disturbance, you might include a feed forward or cascade controller. If you have an integrating system, then you might choose a P-only controller, but otherwise maybe a PI control or PID control. And even with an integrating system, sometimes you do want a PI control anyway. Stability limits and stability analysis, tuning correlations, control performance, and then continue to monitor PID performance. So really this course is set up for uh, introductory regulatory control, some of the theory and mathematics behind control. We use the temperature control lab as part of this. This little lab we've used at the university, but also distributed it worldwide. There are 10,000 of these that have been produced now, about 70 universities that use this little lab to be able to reinforce concepts for data science, machine learning, control theory, and others. It gives two actuators, two sensors, and a simple multivariate control problem. So let me just talk a little bit about the machine learning and dynamic optimization course. This one's a, a graduate level course that combines optimization uh, with dynamics to be able to design systems that have differential and algebraic equations or machine learned models that have some kind of a time bearing component to them, like an LSTM or a transformer that you want to be able to use in a model predictive controller. So in this course, we discuss concepts like moving horizon estimation that you can see in the purple, 
or model predictive control as well. And again, we also use the temperature control lab in this case to not only have a theoretical treatment of these topics, but also to be able to apply it to a real physical system where every student has their own lab that's slightly different and they get to work with it to do the modeling, estimation, and control. I also want to mention, this is a common question that I get, is about getting credit for these courses. Now, the, all of these courses are freely available on the website, the APMonitor.com website, but I also got many requests to be able to offer these for the professional development hours or continuing education units these, um, that many professionals need. And so we partnered with AICHE, AICHE Academy, to make these courses available there as well. Okay, I found this on the web for okay. ACH Academy to make. I don't want that. <laughs> okay, let me close Fine. that out. <laughs> I think it triggered my Siri. Okay, so um, so this is another one, data science with Python as well, and I just want to share with you that um, these courses we have these three available right now, but three additional ones are going to be made available on machine learning. So those are coming for machine learning for engineers. They've broken it into three modules to make it um, a little bit easier to make it through the course material. Okay, so now we have an application of, talk a little bit about my research. Uh, so this is these are some of the projects that we've worked on, and it relates to how we do this, you know, data science, machine learning, dynamics, optimization, model predictive control. So each of these projects use uh, some of those. And one of the hallmarks of working with students is, especially at, the, at Brigham Young University, is that we have about 90% of students who are undergraduates who are involved in research, and about 45% of them are co-authors on publications. And BYU is, it depends on the year, but we're often in the top 10 for number of students that continue on to graduate school. And one year, we are fifth. So we're one of the top universities that send undergraduates out to get a graduate education. Part of that reason is that so many of them are involved in this experiential learning. This is just one example of a project. I'll go ahead and just open this up Okay, this is the um, the flying wing. Okay, a UAV that's uh, meant to deliver internet to remote parts of the world, about as wide as a 737 aircraft, colored in covered in uh, solar panels. And the objective is to try to stay aloft, 60,000 feet elevation, even during winter solstice. Okay, so the most challenging time of the year at 42 degrees north latitude. And when we were first given this problem, we could go about 17 hours. And it, um, you know, we, we didn't have enough energy to be able to stay aloft during the nighttime. And so we gave this to an optimizer to be able to determine how to uh, fly more optimally. And it uh, did something you can see here in the left. It started flying not just in a circular orbit, but it flew in a way that was banked toward the sun in somewhat of a, uh, a modified oval shape. And it was able to collect more solar energy. And when its battery was full, then it climbed in elevation. So it climbed to be able to store the uh, potential energy when its battery was full. And it was able to figure all of this out by using these optimization uh, algorithms combined with these physics-based digital twin of the aircraft to be able to navigate it and perform these scenarios for it to be able to fly. It was able to be able to get up to this 24-hour target to be able to stay up even during winter solstice at that challenging latitude. Also, we've worked on data uh, drilling and how to use technologies like wired drill pipe, okay, that have increased the amount of data that is available downhole. And 
This is analogous to what's happening in many other industries. And you can see some examples there on the right with self-driving cars, maybe 25 gigabytes an hour, a wind farm, 150,000 data points a second, you know, turbine on a jet engine, about 51,000 gigabytes per hour. So in each of these cases, there's a lot of data availability. And what the challenge is, is how do we take that data and turn it into actionable information? So we've also worked on drilling automation using these uh, very complicated uh, physics-based models and how do you create simplified models that can be used in control and automation. Another thing that we've been working on recently is being able to combine the power of optimization and control with some of these other packages for machine learning and data science like uh, scikit-learn with TensorFlow as well, so support vector regressor, can you use that directly in an optimization problem much like that tubular column where you might have part of the design that is determined from a regression, for example. Also, we've been partnering with Seek to be able to make some of these developments easier to use through a graphical user interface through Jupyter Notebooks that are open source. And applications as well in vitrification of nuclear waste with Pacific Northwest National Labs, uh, Department of Energy on some forecast, optimization, simulation, integration in the smart grid systems with small modular reactors and other applications revolving around energy. I'll just mention uh, we've gone through some of these this course material. Uh, there's AICHE Academy, all of the course materials online. But sometimes an organization needs something just a little bit more. And we found that uh, going to the company and working with them directly over an extended period of time, maybe three days with a short course or maybe regular update meetings, has really helped to upgrade a whole organization to use some of these new tools and be able to start exploring. Because really you want to be able to give these tools to those who are most familiar with their process. That's where the impact happens, is where they have new ways of analyzing data, be able to create new applications, and get those applications online so they start making automated decisions. I'll mention just a little bit about my research group as well. I really appreciate all of the graduate students who have contributed so much to this research. Um, as a professor, a lot of times, I'm the face of the group that um, gets to promote their work and the excellent job that they're doing to be able to create these innovations, new software packages, new capabilities. So I really appreciate their work as well. I also like to be able to connect with you on LinkedIn. Uh, so there's a QR code to be able to connect with me on uh, LinkedIn as well. So thank you for your attention and I appreciate this opportunity to share some material about the courses, my research, and also a couple thoughts about data-driven engineering.